Hey, welcome to week 11. Uh, we do have a couple videos this week that'll take up some time, so this video will be a bit shorter. Uh, we are going to start with the basic breakdown of how commission works in the commission video, and that's, that's what uh, the primary focus of today's podcast lecture is going to be, is how do you get paid? Okay, so how do you get paid meaning, where does all the money go? Okay, we briefly discussed commission at this point, but we haven't really gotten into where all the money is going. Okay, now with uh, this particular shift in focus in the course material, we are now going into the last sort of module as I broke the course into modules uh, that, that'll be focusing on the business itself. So following this, we'll get into some paperwork and you'll have a a good snapshot of kind of what you're going to be encountering if you were to choose to go into this business. But once again, because this is a survey course, I'm trying to give you a, a good idea of how it would be uh, in this profession for the first year, for the first few years. I know some of you will not go into it, so I always try and relate it back to general um, rules of, of sales professions, just if you were going to get into a sales profession in general. but. Uh, I do get into some detail in this lecture, so you know we're going to have to. We were going to have to at some point. So this is specific to real estate. Commissions in other industries do work differently. Okay. Having said that, the commission in real estate is remarkably high and continues to stay that way for realtors at certain levels. And we're going to talk about how that works today. And we're going to talk about different options that have come out that disrupt this. Okay. So the disruptors and the discount brokerage packages that are out there. Okay, so we are going to start with a simple explanation, which I don't see a lot of these out there, and I'm sure this will stick around for a while. There is a video here from a more prominent real estate brokerage that has definitely got its feet in the ground in Canada and the United States. These guys are very well known, and they do one of your very standard commissions, and they talk here about how this works. So this is just one example and we're going to talk about different examples as we move through the notes and watch these videos so as always when i run a video in one of my online podcasts i'm not going to make you watch the video in the video i want you guys to pause now and watch this video so you go ahead and pause and i'll see you in a minute all right so uh, that particular brokerage does offer something kind of unique uh, in in that profit sharing feature that they have uh, but there, there are it doesn't amount to a whole lot. If you Google it and kind of research this and see what agents are talking about that, that have worked with them and what they made, it still doesn't mean it's not a good feature. It's kind of cool. But to me, it's a standard 70-30 uh, split or 30-70. A lot of people who, when they talk about this terminology, they refer to the brokerage split first. I always refer to the brokerage split second and put the realtors split first. So it's a standard 70-30 split. This is very common in the industry across the United States and Canada. So we're not gonna get into what goes on in the international markets right now. There's a lot of very different things happening in international markets where the commission is, is pretty much completely arbitrary and, and a lot of people study this industry and get into it and end up making no commission and there's, there's no rules or regulations or anything and anybody could be a realtor. So it does make it kind of tough. But in the United States and Canada, which is where I'm training my students to work, primarily Ontario, Canada, that is a pretty standard commission setup. And I believe that Keller Williams offers that profit sharing thing here as well, but it, it doesn't amount to much. It's just a way to sort of attract, um, remember what Adam Miller said in his guest speaker speech. Any brokerage will hire anybody because all it's going to do is make them money, usually, even if they're not selling anything, because there are still fees that, that you're paying in brokerage. Keller Williams fees, I think, are very light to nil, and there's the, the 70 30 just continues in perpetuity no matter how much money you make. But then you kick into that profit sharing thing, they'll still hire you no matter what. Like anybody, any brokerage is going to hire anybody. Um, it, it's, it, you're not going to get away from that, okay? So the next video uh, will we'll paint a completely uh, different picture of what to watch for. So this video talks about basic commission splits and coincidentally, it's another 70-30 split, which is very common in the industry. That's not what I pay. I'm gonna talk about what I pay and what I've seen a lot in Ontario and in London uh, today in our lecture. But the next video covers a 70-30 split, but it covers, as, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, this lecture is about how you make money. 
okay? And all the money that comes in and where it all goes, because a lot of money is gonna come in. These commissions are pretty substantial, but just like having a store, when your clients come to you and say, well, I can't pay that much money, it, you just, you just, you're doing nothing. You're just putting a sign up and you're doing a heck of a lot more than that. Not only is it gonna cost you uh, to the tune of almost seven grand just to get your license, it's also going to require constant ongoing expenses. And that's what this video gets into. And then we're gonna talk about some of that um, a, a little more Canadian related because this is an American based video, but it's, it's, it's a really good presentation of what people don't think about. And I like it too, because there's a few things that he misses and then those will come up in my notes. So now once again, I want you to pause the video and take the time to watch this video and take a few notes. And I want to remind you guys at this time, as I do with my face-to-face -face students every time, I'm always thinking about questions to put on my tests when I'm going through videos and also through my notes and my lectures. But I will ask you about these videos because I put them in there as they are important resources to me for the second half of the course, this is your reading material because we don't really have books during the second half of the course. So go ahead and get that video watched and then come back to me. And when you come back to me, you will be on this slide, okay? I will see you in a minute. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for watching the video. So, what do we know, okay? We know that there's a 70-30 split and in this scenario, there's a certain amount of money coming in, a certain amount of going to the brokerage, and then there's a bunch of money going to all these other things that we didn't consider. So let's first talk about some different splits. Uh, this is the split that I'm on. Now, you have to look at this and think if this actually makes a difference. And I'm gonna ask my face-to-face -face students right now if you think this makes any difference at all. Okay, this is the split that I'm on. Instead of 70-30, which goes on forever, Okay, and that's how a lot of brokerages are set up. They'll only take 30% of your commission every time you sell a house, but they don't charge you much of anything for fees. You'll still have like certain office fees you can't get around, like the answering service, because that's probably um, messages that, are, that run through the answering service after hours are paid for for an agency that, that's outside of your brokerage. So you probably still have to pay for little stuff like that. Uh, but they're gonna just keep charging you that Whereas my situation with Royal Page Triland, I pay 25%, not 30, of the first 75, uh, sorry, of the first 40%. So I'm at 20, 75, 25 for the first 40,000, not 40%, it's 40,000, okay? And that's not 40,000 like you sell a house and it was like 300,000, so boom, you're already way past it. It's the commission that you make. So we're gonna do a bit of math in a minute. Um, and then after that, until I get to 100, I pay only 5%, okay, for the next 60,000. So that sounds really, really good. But I also pay uh, five or 600 bucks. It's not that much, really. It's, a, it's less than $1,000 a year, depending on the year and how much of the stuff I use. But the answering service is something else. But yeah, my brokerage fees are between five and 600 bucks a year, automatically. So I pay that automatically. Yes. I have a question on the 4,000 kids. Off of your commission, you said. Yeah. So let's say I sold. Let's say I sold one house. Okay. That that was two point something million dollars, and my commission was actually forty two thousand dollars. It would. I would only get seventy five percent of that first forty. What was your question? Sorry, as I interrupted you. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So it's off of one house and one. Like it's off of one house. Yeah. It's off of commission. If your commission is let's say below forty thousand. You still do something? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. Okay, that's a really good question because, and, and my answer probably led to even more questions. So the student just asked, um, if it's off of one house, if you already paid that off, then you don't have to keep paying it. But it's, it, all that matters is the amount. So if I sold a bunch of little tiny condos and I was making like three grand commission here, five grand commission there, seven grand commission there, that number, $5,000, would be going into that 40,000 cap on the 25%. So, and it, it all depends on when it happens, okay? So I have an anniversary date of the end of August. That's when I was first hired by Royal Page. So that's just when my anniversary date is. That's not when your year end is for your, for your T4As that you get from real estate brokerage. That's just when you're, it might not be the same as the year end. 
So my anniversary date is the end of August. So starting in September every year, even if I sold the house, like I may have locked up a deal, like firmed up a deal on a house that I had listed or that a buyer was buying back in July, but it wasn't closing until the end of September. So as of September 1st, my cycle starts over again, okay? Even if I didn't manage to pay it down the previous year, it just starts over again every year. So and, and none of the guys in the videos have made that clear, actually. It's annual. It's annual. You know, that was what I think that was what your question was leading yeah. to, right? So it's not like you just get past it and then for life, everything else you make after that with Royal LePage, Triland, which is who I work for, you just never pay commission on it. Unfortunately, it's not like that. So you're probably looking at this thinking, wow, that's a way better deal. You only pay five or 600 bucks for office fees, and then instead of getting a 730, a 7030 permanent split, you get 25% for the first 40 grand and 5% after that. And then, but is it really? If most realtors, if the vast majority of realtors, and that data was from the US, but it's still very similar, only do, what did he say, six to 10 deals a year? What was it in there again? Um, let me just. Three to six, that was it. Thank you for taking notes. Three to six deals a year. Um, and then it was, as you go up, so the average is three to six. Anybody doing over like 25 or 24, 25 is a big hitter kind of thing. Um, so yeah, average three to six. Uh, that, if you did three deals a year, that doesn't mean those houses are automatically gonna be worth $300,000. You might do one for like 150,000 and you might do another one for 200,000 and it was a friend, so you gave them a bit less of a commission rate. And then you end up making four to six deals a year. I mean, that could only be worth 30 or 40 grand. And then I paid these guys office fees and 25%. I'm like 20 grand, right? It, it, it all depends. So it, it probably is a better deal because overall, if you're selling less, you're still paying only 25% for the first 40 grand. But I'm getting a deal that I sort of, I don't know if everybody gets that same deal actually. I sort of inherited that deal from the brokerage I used to be at. So I kind of was turned over, but I believe they're still offering it. Uh, but you have to pay the office fees. Um, then after 100,000, I get 100% of what I earn. But then, so let's say I, I start my year end on September 1st and I'm paying that 25% on all the stuff that was going through. And there was like four or five deals that I set up in the summer that we're gonna close. If I then sell a house in October that doesn't close till November, if I've already made it past the 40,000 to pay the 25% on it, then it will, sh even if they thought I wasn't going to, it, it's all automatic. It automatically calculates in the system based on how much they pay me from the beginning of my year, which is September 1st, and just keeps going. So, so here, let, let me just show you this for a second. So if I were to make, um, let's say I had 65,000, okay, and all of it was closing right after September 1st. Okay, so 65,000, all of it's closing right after September 1st, but only some of it were deals that I actually wrote up and did after September 1st. That doesn't matter. All that matters is when the money comes in. Okay. So I think that might've been one of your questions oh, too. I'm about to ask another. Okay, you ask, no, I like the questions. Just ask me again. Um, and let's say that I did 15 of that. Let's say I did 25,000 of the commission I was gonna make was based on deals I did before September 1st. And the other, here, so what is that? So that's 40,000. So the other 40,000, okay, is based on deals I did after September 1st, okay? But that is not closing till like, you know, December. Or, but, but none of these deals have closed yet. So not one deal is closing before October 15th, okay? So between October 15th and January 30th, I have these eight deals that are closing. And the eight deals, because one of them is a pretty big one, they're worth collectively 65,000 in commission. But I'm not gonna get all that because I just started my September 1st and, it, and nothing closed between September 1st and October 15th. The first one that closes October 15th, I locked up in July. The next one that closes October 30th, I locked up at the beginning of October. 
The next one that closes in November, I locked up in August, not after. It doesn't matter when they closed. It only matters what money comes in, or sorry, it doesn't matter when I lock them up. It only matters what money comes in after your anniversary date. That's when this clock starts ticking, so to speak. Okay. So um, it, as soon as I get to 40,000, which is gonna be by the end of November, and this is just, total like shot this isn't what it's actually happening with me right now grand events usually pretty slow in the fall i get to forty thousand by the end of november let's say i got to forty two thousand um i paid on that first forty thousand ten thousand dollars to royal page Triland. it didn't matter when i set those up or what was going on that much money came in and that's what i paid the next two thousand after the on top of that first forty thousand would then have been charged five percent so sometimes I see a blended rate. Yeah, so if I have a deal that closed in between me reaching 40,000 and, and I ended up getting up to like 46 or something, I would only pay 5% on the six grand after 40,000, but 25% on the five grand before 40,000. Yeah. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And if and those of you watching the video at home, because I didn't really do that much in my calculator, you might have to, you might have to, um, it's rewatch that. So it doesn't, all that matters is when the money comes in. So I'm gonna take the calculator away here. Um, it's when the money comes in. So when the money comes in after September 1st, every bit of that up to 40,000, I pay 25% on. If a deal doesn't close, which very rarely happens once all the conditions are removed and we get more into that in the coming weeks, how offers are set up and some have conditions and then they're removed. If for some reason the deal didn't close, sometimes people just, really bad stuff happens and they, they end up losing the money somehow and, and then they can't close. They can be sued for that, by the way, but the deal didn't close, but it was expected to close. If the money doesn't come in, it, it doesn't matter. You, you don't get to pay less commission because you booked a deal and then it didn't. When I keep saying closing, what I mean is the money changes hands and the house changes ownership or the property, whatever it is. Um, so. The ones you're asking about are the ones that are hanging in between, right when you're almost at 40,000. And then, see, that's why it's a lot simpler, actually, when you have brokerages like Keller Williams that just go 70, 30, the whole time. Whatever you make, we get 30% of it no matter what. And I felt when I first got into real estate that having this exclusive brand and having the, the, all their, their high-end history of, of superb realtors behind you and that's part of their claim to fame is that they they have a lot of realtors that have done some really high-end stuff that's not going to help me at all i'm going to talk about that later in the notes it's just not going to help me so why should i pay them more money just to have that name on on the sign i'm not saying that it doesn't matter at all i'm not saying go pick a brokerage that has the stupidest name ever and they don't charge much commission that might actually negatively affect your marketing but it's not what you think it doesn't do as much as you think it does okay so i chose royal page and there's lots of rates like remax is really competitive remax has uh office fees that are like five grand a year it depends on the remax but they have like a 15 like an 85 15 split and you get to stay on that of course if you get over 100 and you keep having to pay that then this is a better deal the one that i'm on um there's lots of examples with annual charges and stuff like that. It just, the, bottom line, there is no set way that brokerages can charge commission. Brokerages that feel that they offer a lot of exclusivity and a lot of high-end services to their salespeople, they will charge more. Brokerages that are trying to get started or have founded themselves based on the fact that they're discount brokerages, or maybe they just do things a bit differently, they might charge less and then charge you more fees. This is why you have to shop brokerages and do the math and try and think based on what realtor, what most realtors do in their first few years, which they'd be at the average or below, what's really gonna matter? If you, if you get to a brokerage where it's like, they take hardly anything, they give you no support, um, there's really no one to turn to if anything goes wrong, but they, they literally take nothing. Uh, that might be good if you're only going to sell a couple houses a year and it's totally just this side thing because you're actually a landlord and you just got your real estate license to save on commission, right? But anytime there's paperwork issues, anytime there's issues with uh, applying everything to the trust account, everything would take longer. There'd be issues all the time with, with the level that I'm at and the amount of deals that I'm doing, right? Question. Okay, so 40000 up to 40000 you pay 25% commission. 
Uh, I do, yes, at my brokerage. Okay, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah. And then past 40000 every 1000 or whatever, you pay 5%. Yeah, up, up to, to 100 60. Oh, okay. So after 100 k I get 100%, right? See that bullet? After 100 k I get 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say you do 62 because it's up of next six. Oh, so the, okay, so the I most here, here's a good way to think of it. The mo, because I have a cap, so I'm my split has a cap. The Keller Williams example we saw didn't have a cap. See, this is why I had to have a lecture on this because it's like, and, and the fact that every brokerage has a different deal going makes it even more annoying. But that's why you shop brokerages, right? Not everyone is going to offer the same deal. And these ones with higher office fees, some of those offices include signage. They'll actually make you ten free signs a year. Right? They'll make your business cards for you and it's covered in your fees. And if you're super busy and you start to need more of that stuff and it's covered in your fees, even greater. But they, they often have a cap on that kind of stuff too. So you wanna make sure you use it each year. Um, but I'm not worried about that and I like to do my own stuff. I just wanna keep my commission down. So I will never pay more than, let's see what the heck it is. If, uh, so 10 grand is 25% of 40,000. And then 5% of 60,000 is, there, what is that? I should be able to do that in my head at this point, Michael. Uh, 3,000, that's what I thought. I'll never pay more than 13,000 commission to Royal LePage in any, in any given year, okay? I just won't. It's just not gonna happen, okay? Now, on top of these, and I don't list this in my notes because I don't want it to be this thing that you think you're making money on it and all this stuff. Because these are service-based fees in a service industry, just like legal fees and stuff like that, since I believe it was 2011 when this started, everything here is plus HST as well. So you have to be very careful with the impact of this commission on your sellers. We'll talk a little bit more about the HST thing when we get further down in the slides, but it's not in the notes here because it has nothing to do with the money you make. Whatever HST you bring in, you give right back to the government minus the HST you paid on stuff, like your cost of doing business that had that directly was connected to your business. You can't just take up all the HST you spent that year. It has to be part of your business. So doing your accounting as an entrepreneur, which is basically what this is, you gotta keep track of that stuff, okay? Um, all right, next slide. So the next slide provides some more scenarios. Um, there are brokerages with no split at all, but they have like really high monthly fees. Okay, so you gotta pay like 2,500 bucks a month and they never take any commission, but then whenever you sell anything, you get the whole thing. But 2,500 bucks a month, and that's the last one I checked on that I knew about. That's, um, that's 30,000 a year. Uh, you better sell a lot of stuff if that's how much it's going to be. There are others that are only about a thousand bucks a month, which would be I, I I never pay more than thirteen grand a year. The splits that I'm on that'd actually be a thousand bucks cheaper. But there could be a year where I don't make that much, right? I'm not saying I go over a hundred every year. I I have a couple times, but it's not doesn't happen that much. Okay, so. In that case, I would I would not want the one that's like a thousand bucks a month because I'd be less than that if I only made sixty grand one year. It is a side job for me, right? So you you have to also look at the time commitment you're going to give this and what role it's going to play in in your life. Like it's and we've talked about the fact that you can do real estate part time. It doesn't have to be a full time thing. Everybody thinks it does, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So what's cutting into here? And just one. And I'm not meaning to go too fast either. I'm trying to give you guys a good presentation of this, but there's also videos that you had to watch here. And uh, this week, as I'll discuss at the end of the video, um, I'm gonna give you guys some extra time to work on your projects. Uh, that goes for my face-to-face -face and my online students. So I don't wanna load too much material on you this week. So uh, as we watched in the gentleman's video, the second one, um, that guy was Troy, right? Uh, What's his name again? Uh, Troy, yeah, Troy Sage. He's a very, and he's a pretty well-known realtor in the states. Like he, people know who he is. Like he's been on TV. He's done quite well in real estate. Uh, there were still a couple things that he even missed, and I really liked his presentation. So I want to kind of review what also happened. So, so it's like, oh, that's not that bad. Like, you, big deal, right? You, you work with Royal Page. You make a hundred grand commission. You give him thirteen thousand. You give him some annual fees, and that's the end of it, right? It's not that bad. It's really only 13% total. It's, it's, these are actually really good splits. That's one of the reasons I, I stay with them. They're not bad. I could be doing better at other brokerages 
if I continue to do the volume I've done for the past couple of years, which is a lot. And as I've commented to you guys several times, I don't want you to ever think it's uh, interfering in my life. You know, a couple of things this semester have, but that's had to do with deaths in the family and crazy stuff going on, especially with this class. It actually makes me a better teacher. Having to manage that kind of business and being a teacher makes me a better realtor and it works out great. And I'm very light this time of year. I haven't had calls for weeks. Okay, but I'm not worried about it. I know Grand Bend will pick up again in the spring like it always does. And I have people like already waiting for me to list their stuff in the spring. I'm ready to go. So it's really good for me that I can continue to produce that kind of volume, but I spend way more than I give away to my brokerage on commission uh, just on running my business. Okay, so, it, and Troy's estimate there was fairly accurate. If you wanna do a full scale real estate business and be like a legit, salesperson selling a fair amount of stuff, it's not gonna be cheap. So the first few years when I, I, I was really just doing it as a side thing, I spent practically nothing on advertising. I, I had a website set up, it was half decent. It was basically just to have a website, okay? Now my website requires a plugin that's 40 bucks a month US and without it, I don't even have that stuff and I have more domains and I do custom websites all the time. And now my web costs alone are almost, well, most years they're up to like 1200 bucks where before it was costing me like $120. Okay, it was a 10th of that. Um, and I was doing no print ads. I wasn't running, I, I basically made a few business cards. I got my signs for free because I just started. I was spending hardly anything. Now, I pay my social guy just to keep my stuff up to date even if I have no new listings and I'm not even doing any real estate. I still pay him almost 700 bucks a month to be doing what he's doing. And it's worth it because when you get the big sellers, they wanna see that you have that credibility, whether it's selling houses or not. We've talked about that for three weeks in a row. I'm not gonna get into that kind of stuff, but it's not cheap. I also do paid campaigns. I might spend only a few hundred dollars over the course of a three months doing this. I might be pushing a listing really hard that I think should have sold. I know it's priced right, and I could spend thousands on that. In the course of a year, I could spend five to eight grand on that, four grand on production. Like, so, and he was kind of with me there, okay? But up here, I don't, we don't have Zilla or Trulia. We don't have all these external. Canada is very tight on the way they allow things. I don't know who's stopping somebody from doing that. Um, I mean, the web is the wild west. It's not like anybody couldn't come out and be, but you need that full feed and you need everything organized. It's, it's, and there's, there's also information coming through on Zillow from their registry system in the States that says when the person bought it, how much they paid for it. Canada is really funny about all that private stuff, which is why Zillow hasn't come through, even though it is a matter of public record. Who, what's your neighbor paid for their house and when they bought it? You can just go to the courthouse, pay 10 bucks and get that record. Nobody can keep that information from you. It's, it's public um, information, even though it's private property. So when people, people in Canada that know that and don't want that information out there, they just buy everything in numbered companies um, that aren't necessarily used uh, for the purpose of running a business, but just to shelter the name. And in that case, HST wouldn't kick in and there's all these HST issues. We're gonna have a whole little mini HST lecture in two weeks, um, not yet. So here, uh, we have a little bit less in terms of options. You're basically on realtor.ca if we jump down here as a result of being part of a local real estate board. And this is something you can't really get around, okay? So being part of a local real estate board plus the monthly fee of a plugin to make sure all that stuff is always running through your website, which I consider different costs than just marketing and advertising and web and, and signage and photography and all these promotional pieces of the puzzle. Like that, that thing I'm doing with the, the plugin for my WordPress site, like I'm doing that automatically. So that combined with my fees with the London St. Thomas Real Estate Association, like I'm up to almost 2,500 bucks just for that. London St. Thomas board is kind of expensive. So is Sarnia and Toronto. Some boards are cheaper. Um, like the KW board's pretty cheap. It's less than a thousand a year. I don't know why it's cheaper. Uh, so there's different rates for different boards. It depends on what they have going on. But London's not very cheap and it does cover geographically a fair amount of areas. Like it kind of spreads out. Like I'm, like 99% of the realtors listening in Grand Bend are London board. There's some Sarnia that kind of sneak up. And then everybody listening in St. Thomas is London board, but they get a little bit from the kind of the Tilsonburg Elgin area. There's this other board over there that sort of mixes with us. There's the Oxford board. There's all kinds of different real estate associations and boards. And the Huron County is a big one too. Um, 
And they're also pretty, everybody's expensive these days. I don't know. So then uh, training and continuing education, there's always gonna be something. And on the years when you're required to do the continuing ed, it's another 600 bucks, 450 every year for insurance. Okay, so he, he got into a little bit of capital equipment talk. He was, he was talking about lock boxes and he referred to these as more advertising stuff. That's not, that's capital equipment because you can take it off one thing and put it on the next and you could use it for another business. That's not really advertising material. It's equipment in, in terms of accounting. And he did not mention a car. How the heck does he not mention a car? So you already have a car. Well, it doesn't cost me anything. Oh crap. Now you can write off your insurance, your gas, your repairs. You can write off all this stuff. And you could even write off mileage if you don't wanna write off the cost of the car. If you started real estate right after you bought the car, you don't get to write off the full cost. You only get to, you gotta amortize it down. And then, but that's a big expense. And it's going to be a big expense because you can't get away with not having a car in real estate. We've already talked about that. So he kind of skipped that one and I was surprised. But he got the lock boxes, which is one that a lot of people forget. Those stupid Bluetooth boxes are like 180 bucks a piece. Luckily, a lot of people in great, oh, brutal. They're like, these, they're like honking little computers you hang on a doorway. But I can go on to Amazon and buy like a pack of five of those master lock boxes, which last for like 10 years. And they're like 10 bucks a piece, right? And a lot of people in Grand Bend, we get a lot of showings in Grand Bend that are not in our board, which means they'll have trouble accessing our lock boxes and I'll have to go open it up for them. So most of my listings in Grand Bend, if you're doing a small area where you get a lot of, it's a resort area. So we get a lot of Toronto and a lot of Kitchener Waterloo area realtors showing our listings. I put combination boxes on them so I don't have to worry about it, right? Anything I do in London, always put the London lock box on it or the realtors get annoyed that they even have to go through the combination. They're not cheap, they're expensive, but. They also provide a lot of data. They tell you who went in, when they went in, how long they were in there. So if some realtor goes back and shows your house without a showing, you'll know about it. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I know, it's pretty neat. Um, but those, that stuff's not cheap. I bought a camera and it was for real estate. At, finally, I sucked it up and I bought a good camera because I knew I didn't need my professional guy on every listing, especially if I'm giving someone a discounted commission. So this gets into the discussion we almost got into when we're talking about digital marketing where the level of services you provide is gonna dictate the amount of commission you're gonna charge. Because remember, your brokerage is taking a big chunk, so you wanna charge as much as you can. Most people wouldn't believe me if I said, well, I gotta pay my brokerage almost 15 grand a year just to work for them. Be like, what? That's how it works because a be running a brokerage and having that real estate trust account, doing all that paper, that's a big pain in the butt. So one would think, well, Sloan, if you did like 40 or 50 deals for the last two or three years in a row, how are you in your right mind not starting your own brokerage? Because I have zero interest whatsoever in making that my life and career. Okay, real estate markets can fluctuate just like stocks. I have no idea what's gonna happen next, but I love teaching. This is my passion. And I know if I keep doing a good job, I'll have my job at Fanshawe for a long time, regardless of what the economy's doing. Okay, so I, I make choices like that where, and God, guys, I, I don't know what happened the last few years, but real estate literally just exploded for me. And for the previous seven or eight years before that, when I was doing it, I was happy, it was fine. I was like, I'm making a bit of extra money, makes me a better teacher, this is good, I get to take care of some of my friends. And then it just blew up. So I'm not gonna not take that business if I can handle it and still work at Fanshawe, but I'm not gonna think that that's gonna keep going on forever. If it goes for five years straight, I might consider doing a brokerage with someone else that's gonna do all that crap, but I don't know. So so it's I gotta pay the brokerage. And yeah, it's a big chunk of money, but it's not that much in the grand scheme of things when you think about it. Okay, it's not that bad. Um, so subscriptions, I already talked about that. Printing and gifts. So printing might not have to do with promotion and advertising. I have to print surveys all the time. And luckily I work at Fanshawe, so I have access to really good printing, but I can't run that crap through my Fanshawe account. Well, I get fired. So I, I go in and I, I get a good rate, but if you wanna print a full size survey or you have a big aerial shot, you need a huge version of it because we're trying to figure out where like the lines are for the conservation authority and everything. Like one of those in a big version is like 17 bucks. It's not cheap, right? And I do this kind of stuff all the time for my clients, especially the waterfront ones because I wanna show them that I can provide a higher level of service. I will often show up 
at a listing presentation with stuff like that already printed. No, if I know somebody is shopping realtors, no other realtor is gonna show up with a full color um, aerial shot from the registry system to discuss with them the ramifications of what the conservation authority is doing with their new setbacks. No one would do that. They would just assume that that's gonna scare somebody away, but that's, listen, it doesn't matter what realtor you're working with, it does not matter. You're gonna end up having to deal with that. So I show up, I'm getting ahead of myself because this is on a later slide when I start talking about this stuff, but that can cost money. I buy gifts for my clients. I take clients out uh, for dinner. And that's, that kind of falls into the next one. But, and he talked a little bit about gifts. He, didn't, he kind of discussed it, it wasn't really in his notes. These are things he totally, well, he mentioned DocuSign. I'm specifically telling you to use DocuSign because it's the easiest one and it's about 250 a year. Cell phone bills, like what in the hell? There's no way I would need a new phone already or I would use my phone as much as I do if I was not in real estate. There's, it's just, I would barely use it. I would, like my wife is not in real estate. She uses her phone to talk to me and her family and her friends and then that's about it. We watch stuff on her phone at night when it gets late. I mean, my phone is like, the lifeblood of my earnings. I, I have to have it with me at all times. If I miss calls, people might call somebody else, they'll get frustrated, they'll get anxious, they'll get impatient. You gotta have it, you gotta pay for good service. I need to be able to go to the States and not worry about giant bills. I, I spend a lot of money on cell service every year. Um, Non-promotional postage, I'm always having to mail things, deposit checks, uh, keys, packages to lawyers. Whenever I do that, Express Post is 14 freaking bucks. I never understood Canada Post. I still don't know how they do it. I mean, I can send something to the States cheaper than I could send it to some place in Ontario just because it doesn't fit through this little slot. But their international demand is a lot lower and it's different, so they just don't charge as much. Cheaper. It's insane. So Canada Post costs a lot of money. And they're the most convenient because I'm not always right next to like a FedEx ground or a UPS or something. It's just not that convenient. There's Canada Post everywhere. People think they're gonna be gone in another five years. I don't know about that. Simply because of the brick and mortar infrastructure they've set up for themselves. They are freaking everywhere. And when you need to get something done in a smaller town, they're not gonna come pick it up at your door like FedEx and UPS do. They will not do that, okay? FedEx and UPS. Canada Post will, you can leave it right there in the mail in the community mailbox like that. So it's tough and it costs money, but it's there. And then meals and entertainment for sure. If I even bring up real estate in a conversation when I'm out at the bar or at a restaurant or something, I write it off, okay? So I, I'm not saying that all of that is actually considered a business expense, but I, I could prove that it was, and there, therefore I write it off, yeah. How many made it like a ban on alcohol as gifts can't write off? Uh, well, certain amounts of it. Okay. I can write off the alcohol I buy as gifts at duty free because it's unopened. And then you have a, yeah, my accountant just deals with that. Not, it's not a ban. It's a, they, they've no, really put a higher that. limit on it because no. people were going to the bar and like picking up entire tabs yeah. and saying it was to promote their business. I mean. Yeah. When in fact it was just their giant freaking tab because they think they're the freaking man doing bottle service downtown Toronto and yeah, it's for my business. <laughs> you guys know what's going on. Okay, so be careful with that. Very good, very good point. Um, okay, so this all of a sudden becomes twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars. In Troy's video, he was around twenty US. So twenty-five seems pretty realistic. And he was not saying that like this is king realtor or king of the town, best realtor ever. He was saying. That's what it takes. So my demonstrate, my presentation on commission today, my podcast, is not just about, hey, cool, here's how commission splits work. You're gonna have to know how to do some basic math and calculate percentages and you'll be able to figure it out. It's also about, hey, by the way, you wanna know how much money you make? Don't forget about how much money you're gonna have to spend if you become a salesperson. I got away with a lot less my first few years and that was mainly advertising and meals and entertainment. I just did not do as much. And then I'm always out, I'm running around, I'm doing showings. I have to buy myself food. I'm gonna write that off. And I would not, I would have cooked at home or made something at home or had the great dinner that my wife made me at home if I got my butt home in time when I told her I'd be there. But I didn't. And that costs extra money. Okay, but it, it's it, to the end result of making more. So don't, do also, and I, I'm, I'm glad I remember to bring this up in this particular lecture, do not listen to these people that say, 
Oh man, the harder you work, the more money you give to the government. At, at a certain point, there's just no point working any harder. That is a complete nonsensical argument by a person that doesn't understand basic math. Yes, the more money you make, the higher your, your, your taxable income, your marginal tax rate, the higher your margin, your, you guys were just doing taxes, weren't you? Okay, so you know what your marginal tax rate is, right? Okay, so your marginal tax rate is based on the amount of money you make, the income bracket you fall into, and then there's the other things that play a role, your dependents and other life-changing things, whatever is going on. There's a whole list of stuff. But as you make more and more money, and as you all of a sudden make a crap load of money, yes, your marginal tax rate will go way up, but you're still earning more money and just paying more tax on it. You're still getting more money. And that is a reason to incorporate as a realtor, but you just have to remember that as soon as you take the corporate, as soon as you take money out of the corporation, you would become an incorporated entrepreneur. So you'd be, just basically funnel your earnings through the corporation. When you take them out of there, you have to pay your marginal tax rate still. So it's, it's a good way to do it if you're gonna take it out very gradually. But I knew a couple years ago when I, was, when I just had this smoking year in real estate, I'm like, okay, we're finally gonna be ready to build so I didn't incorporate because there's just no point. I, I'm considering it this year. Um, did, did you guys get into that in your class, the, the difference between corporate tax rates and personal marginal tax rates? I think we're getting to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I pay my tax, and that's because of Fanshawe too. So my taxes this year, my total income taxes, I don't know why I'm actually putting this in the video, uh, came to a total of more money than I actually make at Fanshawe in a year. Even though the money I make at Fanshawe is more important to me because I know it's not gonna go anywhere. It's almost like the money you make when you just randomly sell some lakefront that you didn't really even have planned. It's almost like it's just like a gift, it's a surprise. Now I've worked very, very hard to get to where I'm at in real estate and to get to where I'm at in general as a person. I mean, I have a master's in digital media. There's not a lot of people that can go in there and say that when they're doing a listing presentation. but my taxes were massive just by about doubling what I made. It's not like I made that much more, but then you pass that point where if I was only working at Fanshawe, I'd still have to pay income tax, but it wouldn't be that much. Like the first level before your marginal tax rate starts going up, you really don't pay that much. So I, I get the argument that these people are making. I get it where it's like, geez, I was always making less than a hundred grand. And it was, I think what, I forget what it is. I think it's like 87,000 or something. I was always making less than that. It seems like I hardly paid any taxes. And then I went and worked my butt off and made 150,000 and I had to pay like 40,000 in taxes. Screw these guys. Well, hang on, but you ended up with like $60,000 more. You still made more money. I don't understand why you're more upset. Like it's, so don't ever buy into that argument. If you wanna work hard and make more money, you do it, okay? I love this country. I hate their tax rates, but that's just, it is what it is. So. If I want to make more money and stay in Canada, I got to suck it up and pay more taxes. Okay, um, who is going to be the source of this commission? Okay, because today we're talking about commission. And this is something that confuses people a lot and it's very simple. I would say over 90%, the vast majority of the time, the commission is coming out of the sale price of the property and the seller, therefore the seller is paying it. When do they pay the commission? When it sells. So these realtors that write up all these deals and are going like gangbusters in their first year and they're not calling anybody back and they're not paying attention and there were three things that needed to be dealt with and they totally forgot about them and then a the deal doesn't close, guess what? They're not gonna get paid on that unless it closes. So that's one important thing to remember. And so the seller pays and the seller typically pays when it closes. There are exceptions that I'll talk about here, but that's what's going on. Um, this is the common practice in the U.S. and Canada, okay? In other countries, it works a little bit differently. We have a professor here now from Brazil. He was explaining to me that when someone decides, that, this is really interesting actually, when someone decides they want to sell a property, they approach whichever real estate brokerages they think might sell it, tell them that their property is for sale, and say, we will pay you X amount of commission, and then all the real estate brokers just come and put their signs up on the property. Isn't that crazy? And then whichever one sells it gets all the commission. Whether they do both sides or one side or whatever, they just get all the commission. 
Um, it's very rare. He said one will not work with the other. It's it, so the the buyers just pick which one they want to work with, and that's it. And they get all the commission. The real estate broker just don't work together. Okay. So it is different in other countries, but what we deal with mostly in the US and Canada is you're out there trying to land places to sell and you will negotiate a commission rate with that seller and that will come out of the pro. So wait, Mike, what happens if I go spend a crap load of money on doing um, a ton of video work and a bunch of aerial and we ran open houses and had them catered and all that kind of stuff and that was back in our costs. Uh, lecture and, and that's one of those things that can cut in there. I don't do open houses. I didn't talk about it much. Troy didn't even mention it in his either. It's funny he didn't bring that up. A lot of open houses, it's it's kind of like people think of it as the part of the business, but I'm in a rural market and all open houses are, are the people that live on the street just coming in to see what your house looks like. Nobody shows up. It's not, it's in the city, they work pretty well. Um, so in this market, we try and make them catered and add stuff and that, that adds costs. I just don't really do them much unless I'm doing a higher commission rate. But so it's the seller that pays that. Okay. But you could spend all this money, like I've been talking about high end aerial packages, all that kind of stuff. And it just, it's not, you're not going to get it back unless you sell the property, which is another reason you have to be very careful about pricing. Sometimes the buyers will pay. If you had a buyer approach you and they ask you for something very, very specific and it's not even listed, you know it's probably not going to be, and you're going to have to go out and find it for them, it's good to negotiate commission with them. Say, okay, let's sign a buyer rep agreement. Whatever we do buy, whatever you have to spend on it, because you know how bad you need this, you're going to pay me 2.5% commission on that price. So he would have to buy the thing and then pay you commission, he or she, whatever it is. So. This is a little less common, but it does happen, okay? Uh, where buyers pay the commission. It's usually when properties aren't listed and the seller didn't really intend to sell it and you've approached them directly and you're trying to work out a deal. Um, it also happens once in a while where things get really, really tight on price. And usually there's more than one realtor involved and the two realtors refuse to drop their commission. The buyer's realtor, because he's been working with the buyer for like the better part of two years and they've just been totally brutal and dragged them all over, but it's not their fault because they were trying to find something specific and now it's finally come up and the seller's being a total pain in the butt because they don't feel that they're getting as much money as they should and it's actually is a pretty good price. So they're saying, you guys got to cut your commission and realtors have an option to do that, to get a deal done, but you'll run into situations where realtors won't. And then the seller might say, hey, you gotta split this with me to the buyer, and the buyer pays a bit. So there, and, and now you're probably thinking, wait a second, I thought all this stuff was set in stone. Absolutely not. You set something in stone with your seller when you list a property, and after that, if a deal gets really close and you wanna start changing things just to make it happen, and you know it's gonna be better for you in the long run, to get rid of this person, or maybe it's just gonna be better for everyone in the long run just to get this done because you know the property's hard to find a match. And when you, properties are hard to find a match, um, this is what I'm talking about now, by the way. If properties are hard to find a match. Maybe if you wreck this deal with this buyer, you might not find another one for like a year and that might really hurt the seller. So it's in your best interest and everyone's best interest to get it done and then all of a sudden people start chipping in on commission, it happens. But for the most part, as the first bullet indicates, the sellers pay it out of the price of the listing. Um, commercial versus residential might change that a bit. Um, it might change the commission rate for sure. Commercial is often more complicated, more difficult. There's more finances involved. There's more delivery involved of, of different um, reports and aspects of the property. There could be environmental assessments that you have to study and go through. And you're, you're putting together uh, enhanced marketing materials that are also more involved. There could be a higher commission rate. There could also be a situation where on the buyer side for commercial, um, the buyer has, at, same thing again, they've asked you to go out and search for something. It actually happens more often with commercial. And even if it is listed, you might be in an agreement with them to pay a bit of commission to you and the seller might not even have to know about it, right? Where the, the process of the search in general is so involved and so complicated that they're just paying you 500 bucks a month. Now, you'd be lucky to find a client like that because most of the time, buyers don't pay you anything, okay? And they will be more work for you 
than sellers in a lot of cases. And this is why even with the discount brokerages we're gonna talk about at the end here, you still wanna offer the other realtor with the buyer the standard commission rate in that market or they won't even show it. It's like, screw that, I'm not getting 1% or half a point commission after dealing with this person for three years. You wouldn't believe how long you're with, even six months could put a toll on you if you've had to show them as much stuff as I've shown some buyers. Um, repeat clients, uh, this, this will dictate kind of how commission is paid and who might take a hit. So I, I know I have a builder client that I work heavily with and there are cases where I know I'm, I'm, I'm not taking a hit, but I'm basically giving up income that he'd probably pay me just to make sure he keeps coming back because he's done a lot of deals with me. So there's a higher quantity. So in that case, you could argue that I'm paying some of the commission by not collecting it. I know that's a weird way to think of it. And most realtors wouldn't say that. They'd just be like, no, you discounted it. You discounted it. But I list a lot of properties with him and I list the properties at 3% commission. And if I sell it myself, I'll get two. That's a very good deal in a rural market where things aren't just flying off the shelf. Okay, that is a good deal. Um, but there have been times where I was locked in with him at that 2% and I went down to 1% just to get it done. And that's a situation where I feel that I paid the commission because I basically just took it out of my pocket. Okay, I didn't get the other side to do it. I've asked before, but they don't want to do it. The buyer's realtor has often been through a lot with that buyer. You got to be careful with that. So, but all in all, uh, it, it comes down to, you know, the sellers are paying commission. Then you get to the family and friends situation, okay? You need to be very, very careful here. Do not just assume because they are your friends or family, they want the cheapest commission you would ever charge them. Because I'm telling you right now, because they are your friends or family, they are not going to be less work, okay? And you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyone who's worked with family, who's worked with family in this class, having nothing to do with real estate. And has it been more of a pain than if you would not have been working with family? Okay, yes, that's I'm getting lots of nods. You know what I mean, that they want a smoke and deal. So it depends on who it is. I have my brother-in-law, I hope he never watches this video. His name's Lance. He's, Superb man, okay, the guy is awesome. And I give him the same deal I give Daryl. I give him that 3%, 2% deal. Daryl has done, in the last four years, uh, 22 deals with me. It's nuts. The guy, there's the 80, 20 rule for you, right? And in, in the flesh. He's done 20, Lance has done two, three, three because most of the time I take him and uh, his wife out, who's also lovely, like they're great, but they're just, they're picky like I am, right? I don't usually buy listed stuff either because it all sucks, I want something. Else. That's in Grand Bend. If I was shopping in London, just, I'd have 10 houses to choose from on the market any given day. And there's lots of supply and options. I, wanna, I wanted to be in Grand Bend, I wanted to be this far from the beach, but I, I didn't want to be in this subdivision. And I want, so I had to go and find somebody to sell me a lot because nothing was for sale for years on end. And I did find one. And Lance and Lisa did the same thing. And I'm not gonna make them pay me anything. They try to, they try and offer me money. But even when I was listing stuff where I was getting commission, Lance would call me every day. Dude, I just had this awesome drive by, man. What do you think? Did anybody call you today? What's going on? Even, I'd talk to him like at least half an hour a day when his house was listed. And that adds up, right? And he's, he's amazing. He's a great guy and I'm, I'm happy with the commission I made on the sale of his last house. But he was a lot, Daryl will not even talk to me until the house, he doesn't, he's got so much crap going on. I could have a listing uh, full of spelling errors and he wouldn't even notice. He just trusts me 100% to the moon and doesn't even care. He deserves probably a better, I hope he's not watching this video either. He probably deserves an even better commission rate than I'm giving him, but I've also made him a ton of money, so he's happy to pay me too. I swung him into Grand Bend, and he knew there was a risk, and he knew it might not work out the way I was saying it was gonna work out, but it did, and he killed it, so he's happy. Um, but just be really careful with family and friends, and Daryl at this point I would consider a friend, right? And I keep giving that to him, and then he lends me his trailers, and. He shows up at my house with scaffolding and sets it up for me and doesn't ask for a penny and his kids play with my kids. I mean, it's, it, you know, 
Where Lance, who's also great, and his kids play with my kids, and we're family, and I love the guy to death, and I wouldn't have met my wife if it wasn't for him, um, he's a, he's a, he's, um, I don't want to, it's not a negative thing, because I'd enjoy these conversations with him. He's, he's on top of stuff. He's very proactive. He's very involved. That's a nice way to put it. Okay, so just be careful with these guys. My grandmother probably would have given me a full 3%. I could have done a 5% listing with her and charged two to the other realtor, because two in, in our market up there is what they expect. And she would have been happy to give me that. She probably would have given me even more. So you just have to, but I, but that's different. She just lost her husband, so I'm not charging her anything. And she just keeps trying to give my wife money. We'll see how that works out. But you just, you have to pick and choose your battles and you gotta be careful with family and friends. Because again, where we, where we always talk about how the sellers are, are predominantly paying the commission, when you're working with family and friends and you give them a really, really good deal, once again, you're paying the commission, okay? You're sucking it up and getting, you know. All right, so, um, how does this work? And I'm giving you the standard scenario in this market. You do have markets like Sarnia, where it's like all the realtors got together in a room and said, let's never ever lower our commissions. Even though there are no rules about that, you're allowed to charge whatever you want. They literally refuse to change. Everyone in Sarnia lists at two and a half percent a side, okay? So what I mean is there's two sides to a deal. If you get a listing, and that's how you're gonna be bringing in commission um, directly on a listing, you might have to pay the other realtor some of it too. We've talked about that. It's, it's, I know you know that at this point, but how much does that mean? So if I'm doing a typical, not full service, but maybe my full service listing is four and a half percent, but it's got most of the stuff involved. So I basically, my argument with a lot of my local sellers is, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charge you the same as all these other guys because most of us are at 4%, but I'm gonna give you a lot more in exchange for that than they will. And, I, and, I, and then I prove that to them. Okay, so the typical listing that I see in London or Grand Bend or in most parts of Ontario would be 2% aside. Now, realtors that have been in the business a long time, and I don't know how they convince their sellers of this, because sellers know that there's two sides and there's different ways deals close out. If two realtors are involved, there's 2% for each side. I get 2% for listing it and putting all the materials together and getting it posted and making it look awesome. And then the buyer's realtor gets 2% for having to drag this buyer around until they found the right house, which is also a lot of work. You gotta do comparables and print them market analyses and do all this stuff. But what if I sold it all by myself? What if a buyer just walked through the door one day when I was setting up and the sign was there and what if I do both sides? So this is called multiple representation. There are actually two different forms of multiple representation, which I'll talk more about when we get into the business side of stuff, but it would mean that I represent the buyer and the seller or I just wouldn't represent the buyer. I just tell them I'm giving them customer service and I wouldn't be in a contract with them. I'd only be in a contract with the seller. But what I've done is I've cut out the other realtor for the commission. So this is called double ending. When you hear realtors talk about this, it's called double ending, okay? So in a scenario where I'm charging a full 4%, I will usually only charge three if I double end it. A lot of the realtors that have been doing this a long time, they just charge four anyway, and then they get the whole thing. So that doesn't really benefit this. So to me, Having another realtor involved is not a bad thing because that helps get a deal moving along. It helps close the deal. The other realtor can help mitigate issues that might come up in the home inspection. They can, where if, if we're the only side with a realtor, the buyer's just gonna think, well, they're just saying all that because they're representing the seller. Of course they're gonna say that. So there are a lot of situations where it helps to have the other realtor there. So if I sell it myself and the other realtor isn't there, I feel the seller should get a bit of a break on that. Okay, so my motivation is to make more, but their motivation to allow that to happen and not insist there is another realtor is that they pay less. So I never set a double-ended commission at the same rate as two realtors. I just never do. I always give people a discount, where a lot of the people that have been in the business for a long time, they just never gave people the option. That's the difference, right? They they told their sellers, listen, it's 4%, that's my rate. My rate is 4%. And they wouldn't explain 
that there's some very different stuff going on in the background if they're, if they're the only realtor involved, that they're literally making twice as much money. So I make 50% as much money, or I do something like with Daryl, I make two thirds, okay, instead of one third. But then he only has to pay two thirds instead of three thirds. See? So my double ended deal is pretty good. It's a pretty friendly deal, okay? But I offer more than that, right? So my range, generally speaking, if I'm doing business with a lot of people at once, or not, I will go down to 3% often enough. Like, I'll never do it for people that I'm not doing business. I'll never do it just out of the blue, okay? It's gotta be with repeat clients, and it's gotta be with, with my 80%. If they push me and they, they guarantee they're not gonna demand a bunch of crap, I will do it at 3% for them like I do for Daryl. That's why I do it for Daryl. Okay, if they want all kinds of extra bells and whistles, they want the full on narrated video, they want aerial, they want constant updates on listing photos when anything's changing. They're just, they're demanding a lot more of me and they want, full, they want open houses once a week for as long as this. There's no way I'm doing that for 3%. Because if I sell it with another realtor, I'm still only getting one. And the reason for that is because this other realtor factor, when you get a listing, is, is a huge deal because you cannot discount that. So where you're discounting is always gonna be on your commission. If you discount the other realtor's commission, they won't show it. And then you have to double end it yourself, which might happen eventually, but it's not fair to your seller. It is not fair to your seller to not explain to them that you have to offer the other realtor at least 2%. And if you're in Sarnia, they'd look at 2% and gawk at it. It's crazy. I don't know how they've done that. I'm, I'm impressed, but I, I'd almost feel bad because if you're in a good market and you run a listing up and it's gone in two weeks and you didn't do that much and you took just like their double end is 4% on a $500,000 house, that's a lot of money for not doing a whole lot of work. Now, and now the, the realtors that notoriously refuse to drop their commissions will tell you, well, hey, look who I am. Look at the experience I have. Look what I've done. Look at the heart and soul and the blood and sweat I've put into this profession. Hey, you know what? Free markets are free markets. And eventually those realtors are going to get pinched out because they won't negotiate with the sellers. It's going to happen. Um, so I'm down to 3% to be fair to my sellers, but also because there are all these options out there now that are even cheaper than that. And I have to deal with that. And I've proven to my competitors in Grand Bend that you can win on volume if you beat everyone's price. So it's that simple, right? So I do even say in my brochure that I will match rates, okay? And I have, known, I have been known to be as low as 1% even on a double ender because things went sideways. I just did one that closes in uh, a week from tomorrow. And it's 5.30, so I'm at 1%, so I get $5,300 in commission. Was it worth it for what I had to go through with these clients? Not on that listing, but they made me another five or six grand on another thing they bought with no hassle. So at the end of it, when we realized the market in downtown had slowed down a bit and they want to get it sold before spring, I said, listen, what if I drop? I was going to get 2%. I said, I gave them the Daryl deal because they already bought through me. That's another time when I'll do it. I'll give people a 3% if they buy through me. So, if they, and they already bought pre-sale of their house. And they said, yeah, you know what, Mike, that's cutting your money in half. We really appreciate that. We don't want to do that to you. They're very good. They're good people. Like, but we're just dying here. And that would help. That would make it work. So I did it because I didn't want that listing going into the winter because if it doesn't sell next spring, they're going to kill me. So it was one of those listings, right? So I did it, I made the choice to get it done and it was worth it, as long as it closes, but I'm sure it will. The buyer is very well qualified. I double-ended it, so I was able to do whatever I wanted, right? So there was no other realtor involved. If anyone in Grand Bend, if my competitors or my colleagues in town knew that I went that low on that house after what I put into it, they would be mad at me. They'd, Sloan, why are you doing that to yourself? Well, how could you do that? Because those people, will forever remember what I did and they will tell everyone about it. So there's, there's all kinds of lessons in this lecture today um, that are coming in, still going back to the stuff we learned earlier in the course. But the bottom line is you get to negotiate your own commission, okay? 
you don't get to negotiate with the brokerages. So that's why you have to be careful with this. So um, what's easier to negotiate? Obviously the seller commission between these two, okay? You can't, you can, or you can. You can go into a brokerage and start, you know, swinging your money hat around and saying how awesome you are. But if they give you these splits and you don't produce, they're, you're just, you're, they're only gonna last a year. If you ever negotiate something really hot shit with the brokerage and you get some good splits and they look really strong and you're gonna make this much money and blah, 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 they're only gonna last about a year because why would a brokerage agree to a contract not knowing for sure what's gonna happen that could cut into their commission? I mean, it's, it's tough, okay? So you gotta negotiate with the sellers. That's the easier plane to work on. Um, from there, uh, you can pretty much do whatever you want. So there's Comfree, which is now called Purple Bricks, right? We're gonna talk about that in a second here. They just charge like there's these different rates and different packages. There's like a $500 package and a $750 package and like a $1,500 package. And you, you, you can get professional photos taken and put right on your listing. You can be just on their website or on realtor.ca. And they're across the states. They were Purple Bricks in the states and they purchased Comfree which was our version of Purple Bricks, which came out about the same time. I wouldn't say one copied the other, but of course the one in the States, just purely based on volume, grew a lot more quickly, and they've taken over Comfrey in Canada. So they have these different packages, but they are now recommending, for the same reasons I've talked about today, you know what, this is great that you're saving a lot on getting it listed, getting the sign up, getting the photos done, and there's lots of people that can do that, and sometimes, who better to describe a house in a thousand characters than the owner themselves? But I, I think I do uh, provide a level of skill and experience that makes sure that these sellers are not gonna have anything missed in their listings, right? So I'm, I'm still promoting myself as a listing agent in that way, but the reason I'm doing stuff with only 1% on the selling side, if there's two realtors, is because I have to compete with stuff like that, so you, but I'm allowed to. I can go even lower if I wanted to. I don't know why I ever would. But that's, so, um, I mean, that's really the, the discussion I wanted to have. So how do I do that? Okay, and we're gonna look at my brochure a bit in a minute, and then I'm gonna save that more for you guys to do at the end, because there's no point going through it in the video, but um, you, you do it by demonstrating that you provide them with value. It's the same thing I'm asking you to do in the essay. So everybody's answers are gonna be different, but it's a value proposition. Well, why would I bother doing this with you when I could just use that com-free crap? Well, that's gonna be a lot of work. I mean, you don't have to do any of that work if I'm your realtor. I'm also gonna advise you based on pricing so you don't make any mistakes and potentially have your house sitting on the market for months. I also have a master's degree in digital marketing and I can put a presentation together for your house that makes it look better than anybody could make it look. I mean, you can use broad reaching statements like that out loud. You gotta be careful about putting that stuff in writing. But my biggest thing when I go to people in Grand Bend is I know this market and I know what needs to happen to get this thing sold. And yes, you're gonna pay me some commission, but it's not gonna sit there for eight months on Comfrey. So please let the professionals do the work, right? That, that kind of thing. And a lot of people up there have cottages so it's almost a no, I don't even have to argue Comfrey because they don't want to come up, do photos, do showings. You do your own showings when you're on Comfrey if there's not another realtor. You gotta be on top of that. So you, you need to be living in the house. And I, I have a lot of clients in Grand Bend that they're just cottages. Um, but yeah, you wanna talk about your skills, your background, your niche, all the stuff we talked about earlier in the course, you wanna flaunt that right away. What makes you better? Your history in the market, if it's worth talking about, should be brought up. Okay, and of course, any personal connections you have, because I'm assuming these people are not in your spheres of influence. You're pitching a new listing. They might be on the peripherals, right? You wanna bring that up. Well, so-and-so told me that you were looking to sell and they thought I might be able to help you out. What a nice, unassuming way to approach somebody if you wanna get a listing. Oh no, I don't care if you list with me or not, I just wanna help you out. Freaking right you care if you list with them. You're just saying that because you want them to be comfortable. A lot of realtors are pushy and you don't want to be pushy, okay? Um, just and The other thing you want to make sure about, and I got to put that in my face-to-face -face notes for you guys, sit down and whatever it is that you're talking about and close to agreeing to, 
sit down and calculate it with them. Okay, don't just like say, yeah, it's commission, it's gonna be 4%. Don't just say that, sit down and calculate it with them. Show them the difference between double-ended and not double-ended and then make sure they know that there's HST. So that's the big thing. So as we're wrapping up here, because we're not quite done, but that took a little while. Um, HST, yeah, I can leave that because I don't really want to go much longer. So one of the things I want you to do from that slide is to go to my brochure that was posted in your FOL content last week and this week and take a look at what I've done. It's the simplest thing ever. It's not even put together in brochure format with a bunch of pictures. Um, and I'll show it really quickly here. Um, okay, so if you go back into week 10, you should have it there face-to-face -face and online. Um, and if you take a look at it, you'll see what I'm talking about. I, I give a bit of a preview of the fact that I'm, I'm big on the multimedia stuff up off the top of the brochure, but then I just provide this big old list of stuff. And it's like over the years of doing this, these are the things that people ask me about and or, or have just started to assume that all realtors are doing and most don't even bring them up. So I always bring this brochure in to make sure that people know that I'm offering these things. Uh, so just in case I forget to even bring them up, right? I might not even remember. But, and I'm not gonna go through every one of these things in this video, that's what I meant, is it's just gonna take too long. But I did wanna scroll down and show you how I do my commission. So I don't advertise, um, uh, what is it? I don't advertise a 3.5% commission rate. Nor do I even advertise a three, or, or sorry, three percent. Nor do I even advertise three and a half, which is probably what I do most of my listings at is three and a half. I shouldn't have said that I do most of them with three. That's more for repeat clients and people that are doing two things with me at once. Um, so I do have a breakdown. This is really important that you give people this. Most realtors never do. Like you need to sit down with these people and say, this is exactly how much it's going to cost. Okay, well two percent. Uh, so if you sell it yourself, it's only two percent because I bought this thing through you. That's a really good deal. But 2% of $400,000 is eight grand. And then you throw HST on there, which is 13%, and there's no getting around that unless you wanna pay it yourself and absorb it, but then you're not really getting 2%. So then it becomes nine grand. It's a thousand bucks on HST, and that's only $8,000. Think about how the HST would be if your commission was a big one, right? So you wanna make sure you're upfront about this too. And that was one of the other things I wanted to remind you about. Um, then just wrapping up here, uh, what usually doesn't matter, and I was gonna go through and see if you guys could come up with some more stuff, but I think I've talked enough about this topic now that we've beat it to death. Um, these are a couple things I wanted to remind you of because this just won't help you at all. Don't choose a brokerage that no one's ever heard of and, and is just confusing and it might seem like it's for sale by owner, but it's not. And it's, You wanna be with some kind of known brand but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which one, okay? If you wanna pick the one where your friends are working, good, they'll help you out. Where colleagues are working, where your parents are working, whatever it is, that's fine. It's not gonna make that much of a difference unless your commission splits really suck and you don't wanna be there. But the other thing that doesn't matter too is who else works there. Well, so-and-so, you've heard of so-and-so, don't ever do that, okay? Well, you've heard of John, he, brings, he, he lists all the big stuff in town. I work at the same place as John. Then they're just gonna go, Shit, why am I not just calling John then, right? That's a mistake that a lot of realtors make at the beginning is you can sell yourself, okay? That's what matters. And you can negotiate the commission from there. And as long as you're with something, some kind of brokerage where the signs, that's the biggest thing. Do the signs look half decent and professional? I mean, you don't wanna be with a brokerage with some crazy looking sign, okay? And then at the end of that, we have the discounters and interrupters. And these are the ones that have pushed us down on commission. And I'm okay with that. I like being more competitive, right? So you have PC275 out of London. They started in London. Now they're, they're kind of branching out in other cities. They will only charge the client 2.75% total commission. But it's the same even if the realtor double ends it, which you guys know what that means now. That's actually a pretty decent double-ended commission. So those realtors notoriously go out of their way to keep the buyer's realtors away even though they're still advertising 2% to the other realtors. So it's, and they're good realtors. I don't want to be, but 
You shouldn't be going out of your way to keep them away. You should just be marketing the thing harder and, and be working harder to get that double-ended commission. So it, they claim that it makes their realtors better because the only way they're going to make the big commissions is to work harder. But I don't know. I I don't know. I, I You know, there's some guys there that I really like. I love the guys that started it. It's a great idea. It's smart, okay? But I can offer the same. I still will. I'll match that any time. I just don't advertise it. So that's the thing I wanted to tell you. You can... If somebody else is out there doing that, there's a guy in Grand Bend that calls himself 3% Realty, and he does everything 3%. If he sells it himself, it's 3%. I'm beating that already. If I sell myself, it's two, right? So I, 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 I just tell people, whoever you're talking to, I'll match it. Don't worry about it. I do not like matching PC275 in Grand Bend because it's a longer selling cycle. There's a little more work involved, but I've had to in the past, only on a bigger listing, right? Purple Bricks is the new Comfrey, same thing. So do we worry about these guys? A little bit. What do you do to get around it? Value. You gotta give people value, okay? Um, sorry, I, I meant that to be a shorter one. It turned out to be a long one, but there's lots of good information in there about commission. That covers our week for uh, lecture, okay? And the rest of the week will be spent working on your project. And I will be available for help anytime. I'll be checking email every day. And for my face-to-face -face students, you guys come back Wednesday. I'll be here to help you guys with anything you want, okay? But no new material planned.